you want to look at it this way, Jesus is the descendant of an interracial marriage, you know, because Ruth was of a different ethnicity. Thank you for tuning in to the Removing Barriers podcast. I'm Jay. And I'm MCG. And we're attempting to remove barriers so we can all have a clear view of the cross. This is episode 19 of the Removing Barriers podcast. In this episode, we will be discussing interracial marriage. How are Christians to view this? What is it like being in an interracial marriage today? It was only five decades ago, interracial marriage was illegal in many states. Join us as we will attempt to remove these barriers with our guests. Today we have with us Sam and Alyssa. They have three kiddos and they've almost been married for about five years. And Sam is a software engineer and Alyssa is the home engineer, queen of the home. And uh, we're so happy that you guys are here to share your perspective and your insight and your wisdom with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Sam and Alyssa, welcome to the Removing Barriers podcast. Thank you for having us. Right. So as I said, we're going to be talking about interracial marriage. Before we get all into this and all the questions we have, how would you define interracial marriage? It's um, it's a good question. Do you have anything to say on that, sweetheart? (laughs) Well, I'm I'm curious to see what you have to say. Well, it's two people of different ethnicities. That's just my take on it. Getting hurt, so yeah. I mean, I guess. That's a tough one for me because, and I, and this might be another question that you have coming, but I don't really see black and white as being different races. So, I mean, but if somebody were to ask me, are we an interracial marriage? My answer would be yes. So colloquially, I guess interracial marriage would be marriage between people of very different ethnic backgrounds, you know, or something like that. So black versus black and white or. Hispanic and Asian or whatever, stuff like that, you know? Yeah, and I'm glad you touched on that because is there such a thing as interracial marriage anyway, culturally or even biblically? It's a good question. I only see us as one race, you know, and I guess if you look at it from the Bible, you know, Jesus died for all of us, uh, and so we're all the same blood, you know, we all come from Adam and then We all come from Noah, you know, after the flood. So we're all really cousins in a way. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you said that, Sam. I like the word you use. You just colloquially, yes, okay, we're in interracial marriage. It's just how we speak, the idioms that we use in our language that would make it so that we would say, oh, yeah, we're in an interracial marriage. But, you know, biblically and logically and truth, in terms of reality, there's only one people, one race, one blood. Not necessarily interracial, but that's just how we speak. That's the idiom. That's what we we say. But it seems like, well, it's not. It doesn't seem like it's just the reality that it's been such a big deal, not just in the this culture, but in many other cultures. If you were to marry someone that's not from your same ethnic group, it's like oh, this big issue. And some people have gone so far as to call it a sin or to treat other people as though they have sinned, would you say, in your opinion, that interracial marriage is a sin? I would argue no. I mean, first of all, um, from, you know, just what we... Obviously, I'm biased in this, right? Um, (laughs) From what we were just saying a moment ago, you know, first of all, the, the thing is, are we really different races? And I think the answer there is no. But even if we were to say, okay, well, even though we're the same race, we may have different ethnicities, and maybe it's not lawful in a uh, moral sense to to marry between ethnicities. I think the Bible kind of speaks the opposite, you know, because the very first example that pops into my mind is the people were complaining, you know, about Moses and his wife, her being of a darker complexion, you know, and the Lord wasn't pleased about that, you know, so... And he wasn't pleased about the complaining of the people about Moses' wife. So that, to me, suggests that that was fine, you know, and that the people need to be okay with it. And I think, you know, because growing up, I've heard so many people say that it is a sin. And, you know, I think that has affected a lot of people I've seen over the years where they ended up, you know, not marrying um, 
Well, for example, I had a friend and she was white and she was interested in a black guy and her parents are like, no, that's, that's a thing. You can't do that. And so she ended up not marrying that guy, which is very unfortunate because I think it would have been a match. But anyway, and I've had lots of other people say that it is a sin, but I think they're getting confused because the Bible does clearly say that we are not supposed to be unequally yoked as believers. And so, yes, believers should not marry an unbeliever. And so I don't, I think they're taking that to the extreme though when. Maybe it's because Jews shouldn't marry pagans. And yeah. And so typically, you know, the Jewish people were all one ethnicity in the Bible for the most part. And so maybe that's where people are getting confused. So if you went, if a Jewish person went and married a Moabitess, then that was an issue, but it's not because she was of Moabite blood, it's because she wasn't a Jew, you know, uh, religiously speaking, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting because amazingly you alluded to the Jews not marrying the pagans, but the Bible never necessarily restrict them from marrying outside of the someone from like the Jew, the Bible restrict them based upon the fact that they will turn their heart away from God. If you look at Solomon, you know, prime example, he he what he had seven hundred wives and the Bible said they turned his heart <laughs> away from God. And if you look at David, his father, he as well also had several wives and which also turned his heart away from God. And that's the thing what God was trying to prevent in that command was to say, hey don't marry someone of another religion, of another belief system. And you see that come over in the New Testament when he's talk about not being unequally yoked together with unbeliever. Because I've never seen the, the term race in scripture to mean what we mean culturally today as race. Okay. Yeah, I just want to reference that because it really stuck out to me. It's in Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 6, and it's kind of what you were saying, where God told the Jews not to marry the Canaanites um, because what you were just saying, they would turn their hearts away from God. And so, yes, I think that's where people get hung up. Oh, okay. So we, so we shouldn't marry from other groups of people, so to speak. Melissa, you touched a little bit on what the Bible says in Deuteronomy. And you also talked about how you, even you heard when you were growing up that marrying interracially was a sin, or at least it was looked down upon and I'm sure you've probably heard it from perhaps in some cases from the pulpit or maybe from friends or, or whatever. When, whenever they said that to you or whenever you heard it, was there ever like a biblical sort of, did they ever try to use the scripture to defend what they were trying to say? Or, or was it more just like, hey, we just don't do that? Or did they try to use scripture to make a case? I think there are two groups, some where it was just kind of like in their mind, like this is just what I think. And then the other group was where they would kind of pull from, I think, this Deuteronomy passage. Mm. And that's kind of where they got their thinking. But I don't think they delved far enough to look up the example of Moses and then even Rahab. And there was one other one. Rahab. And then also Ruth. Ruth and Boaz. And so there's several examples there. And you know, they're in the line of Jesus now. And so, yeah, very interesting. I love what you said when you said, you know, they just read it on the surface and didn't look deep enough to see that the general trend, the, the example of scripture is what we were all saying in terms of God doesn't want us to marry someone whose faith, whose religion will turn us away from him, not you know, based on skin color or where they're from or anything like that. And so if you do kind of read the scriptures on the surface, you can easily walk away with that false teaching. But you said it beautifully. They did they, you just don't look deep enough. You're not you're not reading the scriptures and letting the scriptures speak for itself. Earlier we were talking about Solomon and how he had well, David and Solomon, but Solomon in particular, how he had married a lot of women and a lot of them were pagans, uh, from other countries. And they turned his heart away, got Solomon involved in a lot of wicked practices and, and whatnot. At least turned Solomon away from God for a time, I guess I should say. But I think Solomon made two mistakes. One was marrying pagan women. And the second one also, or whichever order, is he married a lot of women, you know. And the Bible clearly says, I want to say it's Deuteronomy 17, 17, that kings aren't to take multiple wives into themselves, you know? And so that that was a dangerous thing that uh, Solomon did. 
honestly, uh, looks like he and probably the kingdom paid the price for it because that might be why we have the, uh, why they have the split kingdom, you know? A lot of people who are against an interracial marriage, what they want to prevent is a mixing of those cultures so that you either don't lose your faith or don't lose your identity. And I'm wondering if people who profess Christ yeah. and they believe that interracial marriage is a sin, are they confusing the two? Are they kind of just looking at other people groups and thinking, you know, you don't look like us, and so you must not have the same faith as us, and so interracial marriage, no, let's not do that. Or are they just naturally prejudiced and don't like other people? Where do you think for among people who profess Christ, where do you think they fall on that spectrum? You know, I think the answer is a bit of both of the scenarios that you gave. And I don't, I don't really know so much because that kind of prejudice is not so much. Okay, don't get me wrong. There's prejudice on my side of the family, mm -hmm. but it's not arguing that interracial marriage is a sin. It's prejudice for other reasons. Mm -hmm. Primarily, uh, experience from a lot of the black folks in my family they went to the civil rights movement and all this other stuff and so it's more they just didn't want mixed marriage because of her feelings you know mm -hmm. but on the other side i think on Alyssa's family side at least based off of stories i've heard it seems to me that both of those scenarios might be what kind of played a role and to, to be honest i didn't get like a harsh welcome from her family or, her, or from her immediate family, but it may have been, you know, just a, just like a, a, a step away from her immediate family. Uh, some of the family members were may, maybe not so uh, excited in the beginning. And I, and I think, well, Alyssa can, can probably speak more on this, but my, my feeling was that they didn't think right away that I was a Christian just like them. Uh, so maybe they thought that I was, you know, you have people that say they're Christians, but their belief is so vastly different than your own. Right. It's like, how how can they even call themselves Christians, you know? And they may have kind of put me in, in a pocket like that. And then also, it may be just the whole idea that it's a sin as well. I'm, I'm not sure. Alyssa can... Yeah, I think it was... From the individual I'm thinking of, I think they thought it was just a sin because I think people have just bought into that lie mm -hmm. that, oh, if you do that, you know, you're going to be living your sin kind of a thing. And so, anyways, as soon as, you know, it was talked about just the fact that, well, they're both Christians and, and God loves it when, you know, people of Christian faith marry so they won't be living in sin. And then it was like, Oh. oh, yeah, you're right. That was the individual's response. So then it was it was a, a, a deal or anything. So after that, but now, we also have to state we're not the first interracial marriage in our family either. So my brother is on he's on before me. So <laughs> but he married a girl from Guatemala, and so um, as you can imagine, it I'm mostly thinking of my grandparents who had the objection. I so, and it wasn't like they didn't like her or anything. They did welcome her in the family, but you could still sense, you know, something a little off. Mm -hmm. they, they passed on now, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, that's, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> you know, I always recommend marriage counseling whenever someone gets in marriage. Of course, I think marriage counseling. But did you guys get any specific counseling on this issue um to say hey you guys are entering into quote unquote an interracial marriage and you guys gonna have probably some challenges that my wife and i might not have because we culturally we we have the same race did you guys ever get any special counseling on on that front it was just a very little little amount we went through marriage counseling and so in the marriage counseling um, pre-marriage pre counseling. Pre -marriage counseling. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything against marriage counseling, but yeah, before we got married. Yeah, our counselor basically just asked us, hey, um, have y'all considered the differences culturally, what it may be like? You know, are you aware of that? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that was pretty much it. Just consider, you know, the differences in that area. 
So that was it. <laughs> what about among you two? Did you guys discuss it any at length or anything before you get married? You know, I don't feel like we may be uh, a little bit more unique. I don't feel like there's much of a difference culturally between Alyssa's family and mine. We're, I mean, the differences between our families culturally is almost as as uh, the same as between any other two families in America. You know, if you had two white families get together, you'd have a certain amount of difference between the two of them. Right. I feel like it's pretty close to that kind of a difference. Yeah. So very easy, I thought. Uh, maybe the biggest difference is that. Uh, we might like a little my on my side of the family we might have a little bit more enthusiastic music perhaps i'm not sure <laughs> yeah. That's well, Alicia, right <laughs> well alice i already told us that you have more rhythm so i don't know <laughs> the jury is still out on that one for me though <laughs> do you know i used to practice capoeira <laughs> seriously yeah wow okay interesting yeah. Yeah, you definitely need rhythm to uh, to practice capoeira, for real. This is the Removing Barriers podcast. We will be right back. Sometimes, no matter how great the selection, you just can't find exactly what you want. Design It Yourself custom gift baskets solve that problem by allowing you to choose the specific products you want to include with your unique gift basket. And in addition to hand-selecting the products, you can further personalize your custom basket by adding coffee mugs, stuffed animals, mylar balloons, or even an imprinted ribbon. When you're done, we'll put it all together in a -a one-of-a-kind, perfect basket and ship or hand-deliver it directly to your lucky recipient. Click in the description section to design your basket today. Let me ask you guys this, because we talked about what it was like t- for your family to have you guys be married and to, you know, to go through that and some of the reactions that you've gotten on both sides. And I think later on, we'll ask you how you've been received in the body as a whole. But how do you feel like your your marriage has been perceived or received by people out in the world, just, you know, neighbors, friends, acquaintances that you run into is it different is it the same uh, what what has been the general vibe do you get off looks or or how does that work well with our neighbors and like people at church and stuff it's uh generally no big deal like i don't even think about it you know the fact that we're white and black so i don't i don't see it and then they act just normal with us but i will say that after we first got married I noticed we looked like crazy just when we would go out into Walmart or go out to eat. Anyway, but then after a while, I just quit seeing it. So, (laughs) (laughs) So, people probably do, but I don't do. I think more so they just love our our kids, honestly. And so they love talking to our our babies. And um, I don't know. I don't think it's as big of a deal as, as what it was, obviously, years ago. It could be our location, too, where we live. Yeah, I mean, so I, I noticed this, too, and that is when we were first married, we were treated one way, and, and don't get me wrong, uh, believe it or not, here in the South, we've been treated, I would say, pretty well. But you, you would just get some funny looks from time to time. And since we've had kids... I don't notice that so much. I don't know if I'm just not paying attention or if the people are now focused on the kids and, oh, cute kids or whatever. I don't know what it is. But. You know, and it's also interesting because I think a lot of people go out of their way to make sure that we know they like us. I don't know why, mm-hmm. but it's interesting. Like, a lot of people will, will pay for our meals and just give us free stuff, like, to the kids or whatever. It's, it's really interesting. Wow. Yeah. That actually... That makes me think of one time we were traveling up to Michigan to see her family, or we were going somewhere. We were going to go to Michigan eventually. We went to, wow, I hope this is not insulting. I I certainly don't mean to be insulting, but we went to like a little hick town in Mm -hmm. Tennessee, right? And I love little towns like that. When, When I'm single, I love them because even though not always did I feel like they loved me back, I grew up in 
or I was born in more the northern portion of Georgia, and I'm I'm used to being around that kind of people, you know. Mm-hmm. So it brings back good old memories for me. But anyway, since getting married, I get a little nervous when we go to some small towns like that because it's like, oh snap, how are they going to treat us? You know, I don't know how this is going to go down. So we stopped at this kind of hole in the wall restaurant. It's trying to look like a Cracker Barrel, but it's not anything like Cracker Barrel. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, and so we kind of walk in, and I'm feeling a little nervous. Oh boy, and and. People were, in the beginning, I didn't, and it may have just been my own imagination, but it felt like people were kind of cold to us, you know. But uh, halfway through us, after we sat down, we got our food and whatnot, some people would come up and they would say some nice things or whatnot. They would comment on the children, uh, beautiful kids or whatever, stuff like that. And in the end, we walked out of that restaurant and somebody had paid our meal, you know. Oh. And so... That was kind of that was kind of nice, you know. So it's anyway. Yeah. So we, yeah, we left that town with a good feeling, you know. So yeah, that's good. It appears to me that sometimes, especially, and maybe Sam, you can speak to this, but it seems like in the black community, especially, that if a black woman should marry a white man. It's kind of looked down upon. But if it's the other way around, it seems to be okay. Is that my imagination or do you see a reception differently as opposed to, so you married a white girl, as opposed if, say, your sister were to marry the white guy? You know, I, I think that the experience is different depending on the family and the community that you're in. I, it seems to me that yeah, I might say if you're a black guy marrying a white girl or dating a white girl, then the reception that you get from the black community is more likely to be okay than if you're a black girl dating a white guy. But I Yeah, I guess I guess it just depends. I know I've gotten some some flack from the black community for for okay, so this is kind of going back in history a little bit, but I was dating a white girl earlier, right? And I got some flack, and it wasn't from the men, but it was from the women. Mm-hmm. One one woman in particular, I'm not going to mention her name, close close relative of mine, got a lot of flack for that. And sometimes I don't know, maybe in that case, it's a case of you know, I I don't know what it is. I think it was past feelings of hurt and then maybe some strange kind of jealousy if you will she was way older than me but maybe she was thinking that you know she may have missed out on some opportunity or something and then is now trying to i'm not exactly sure what the thought process is there but you know so that's kind of interesting and then even just like uh, this is not my own experience but i was watching another couple uh interracial and the black guy white girl and uh, they were walking out of an Applebee's I happened to be eating with them and uh, as they were walking out all of the I'm not trying to hate hate on black women uh, but a lot of the black ladies were giving the guy a death stare sure. but the black guys are kind of like thumbsing up the guy <laughs> <laughs> like oh good, good good catch man or whatnot so and then you would see the the black girls that were with the black guys they were on dates you know it's like a double or triple date they kind of stared down their dates, you know, kind of like looking at them kind of angry. So anyway, so yeah, black guys get a little flack for it, but I think white girl, uh, black girls may get even more flack. I don't know why. It seems like from my perspective, and I could be wrong on this, within the perspective in the black community, when a black man marries a white woman, now we're talking like how the unsaved think, right? We're not talking about brothers and sisters in Christ who know better, but um, when they see a black man marry a white woman, it seems to be like this sort of you've arrived trophy kind of thing. You know, you've surpassed some sort of echelon or something. Whereas if a black woman dates or marries a white man, she's almost always accused of hypergamy. Like she's just marrying to move up or marrying out of her social class to move up. And it seems almost like a, 
I hate to use this word, but a parasitic sort of relationship instead of a mutual one. And so perhaps that's why when, when a black woman sees a black man dating a white woman, she feels like white women already. Now, again, we're talking unsafe people the way they think, right? White women already have everything. They're like part of the patriarchy or whatever terminology they're using right now. So why are they taking away the so few good men that we have? And they take away the good men and all we have left are the drug dealers and the jailbirds and et cetera. That's probably how they feel. That's probably why they're giving other black men or even the white women the death stare. Like, what are you doing? You're just, you know what I mean? I've gotten that death stare a lot. Yeah. So it's almost like a competition thing. Like, good black men are scarce, so what are you doing picking the very few that we have? It just seems to be that kind of combative. Praise the Lord, all of that is done away with in Christ, right? But, like, in the world, that seems to be how they how they think. Or maybe that's why such a... There's a difference in the response in terms of the gender of who's dating what color. Um, maybe that's... That might be one of the things. And and so that's why we were asking, how was it received, you know, in your respective families, in the world? What about in the church, in your local body? How have you, has the reception been warm and welcoming or have you gotten looks or has it been awkward? Have you had to explain yourselves or how, how has it been in your local body? There was only one incident that I remember. And it wasn't much of anything. It was in a fellowship type setting. We were sitting at a table and the man across the table from us just got up and left. So that's it. It wasn't anything big or. But that, that guy and I, we have a little bit of a history. So whenever he sees me with Alyssa, most of the time Alyssa's not there, but we walk by, he sees us and then Alyssa goes on. Maybe she's taking care of the kids or something. And he just kind of looks at me. I don't know what his deal is, but he, it seems like he doesn't really like to be around, uh, mixed couples very much. So yeah, when we ended up sitting at his table, he got up and left. <laughs> so mm. it was a table like everybody from the church. We just had tables and you just sit anywhere. It's not a signed scene or anything like that. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. But he's the only at our church that has given us any noticeable, uh, everybody else has been super sweet. It's, you know, we're all just family, so. Now, Alyssa, when you mentioned that Sam probably went through more than you did, what were some of the things that you experienced, Sam, within the body? You know, my experience in the church isn't that extensive, but I've had a few funny incidents. This is going back to, I guess, I was dating, I've only dated one other person, right? She was white as well. She was not my first choice. I actually had tried to get things going with Alyssa first, but she turned me down, so then I moved on to, to this other girl, which obviously it didn't work out there, and that's fine, because I've got Alyssa. <laughs> my first choice, so. Uh, <laughs> so. Aww. <laughs> but, yeah. So we went to a church. We were looking for churches in Mobile. So she was going to school here, and, and I was working here. And so we were looking for churches in Mobile, and we visited a church that seemed pretty conservative. So that's good, because that's what we were looking for. But it, we didn't know it at the time. It was a Southern Baptist church. And it's kind of funny, because I didn't really think of Southern Baptists as being conservative. But we went to the service. Everything seemed fine. Uh, at the end of the service, we had a couple approach us, actually a few couples. But most of them stayed back a little bit. and then. One of the ladies from, I guess, the lead couple, if you will, they approached us, and I think they were related to the leadership of the church. They they approached us, and they're like, "Hey, it's good, good to have you all. What's the nature of your relationship? You know, stuff, something to that effect." And we're like, "Um, uh, we're dating, <laughs> you know, kind of." Oh, oh, okay. Well, we just wanted to let you know that you might want to attend a different church or something like that is what they said. This may not be a church for you. You may want to go somewhere else. And, uh, yeah. <gasps> yeah. Straight up. So, I mean, wow, I guess it could have been a little like bit that? more clear. You wow. know, we don't like interracial couples here. That would have been more clear. <laughs> but uh, it was that was pretty bold, honestly. So, yeah. So, 
we we left there. We didn't go back, obviously. Um, but yeah, that to me that's a an embarrassment, you know, to to Christianity uh, to have something like that happen. So you know. So, but other than that, my by and large, my experience at church has been pretty good. Even actually, I take that back. Even the church that we go to now. Everybody seems good today, but when I first showed up at that church, there were quite a few prejudiced people there, and that were not afraid to make their prejudice known, mm -hmm. if you will. So we may have a few people that are prejudiced at our church now. We don't know it, you know, other than that one guy that we mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. But, yeah, there were a lot more vocal folks. They have since mm -hmm. left, actually. I, I think they got a little upset when I showed up. I wasn't even dating at that time. I don't think that they were too happy to have me there. I kind of get the impression just from hearing from others that they were chatting with the leadership of church and with pastor and saying stuff about me behind my back and whatnot. But uh, it sounds like the church leadership uh, stood up for me. Well, praise the Lord for that. And I were talking, I can't remember how long ago it was, but not too long ago, we talked about when it comes to race relations in this country, the church has such a self-inflicted sort of gunshot wound when it comes to race relations, because we have the truth right there in scripture, and yet we're not living it out. And it's a point where the world can just kind of point at that failure and go, aha, see, church is racist, and that just disqualifies all of Christianity. And it's just such an unnecessary self-inflicted wound. And like you said, it's an embarrassment that should ever even happen in the faith. But yeah. praise the Lord that your church leadership stood up for you there, stood up for truth, basically. Yeah, we're in a sad state. And as Jay said, that when someone ought to say against you, other than the fact that Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection, according to the scriptures, even anyone can say anything else against you beyond that, you know, it becomes becomes an issue. People, folks shouldn't be able to point to the church and say, you know what, the church didn't do X, Y, and Z, and it was all because of some characteristics of yourself that you can't really change. You know, you didn't ask for, and that was given to you by God. This is the Removing Barriers podcast. We will be right back. Antivirus software protects you from malware. But to protect your privacy and security on the web, you need a virtual private network or VPN. Did you know that Ivacy offers an easy to use VPN app for each of your favorite devices? From Windows, Macs, and smartphones to smart TVs, tablets, and browser extensions, and even gaming consoles. Get Ivacy for your choice of devices to secure your connection, browse with privacy, and access content from anywhere in the world. Go to ivacy.com or click the link in the show notes. Use coupon code Removing Barriers for a 20% discount. You know, they normally say if you're a black family, you have to give your kids that talk, uh, whatever the case may be. Do you guys plan to talk to your kids about race and being, according to this culture, mixed race? I know your kids are pretty young now, but do you guys plan to talk to your kids anything about race and interracial marriage or being a mixed child growing up in America today? You know, um, honestly, before our conversation, I had not even thought about having any such kind of talk. That's interesting. I have been on the receiving side of that talk, if you will. But so I think there is some value to having a conversation like that with your kids, especially depending on where you are and where society is. So in some environments, it makes more sense than in others. I think that if we were to have a talk like that with our kids, it would make more sense. Uh, I, I see the talk going two different ways, typically. Sometimes I see people giving the talk and they're giving the talk from like a victim mentality, like because, you know, they focus on oh, oh, there's mm -hmm. a lot of white people that hate black people and, and you got to watch out because the cops are going to shoot you if you say one thing off or something like that, you know, which there may be an element of truth to that, but I don't see that as being such a constructive right. conversation to have with your kids. 
the conversation that it wasn't so much my parents. I think my parents may have kind of danced around it, like given me information and let me figure things out on my own. And my grandparents may have had more to say. They have way more experience too, because back in like my grand, my granddad's time, he, uh, he just recently passed, but we had chatted years ago. And, um, you know, he doesn't, first of all, he doesn't like to bring up issues like this too much because I think he wants there to be harmony, but he just was warning me on a few occasions because he, when he was a, a boy, he and his friends, I say boy, he may have been like a teenager or so. He and, and some of his friends went out and played, went and played in the field or whatnot, or maybe it was not too far from the city. This is out in the country, but you have like, it's not downtown city, but like a, uh, an area where it's more populated, I guess. So you might have the market and stuff like that. Anyway, they were playing, and if I remember mm-hmm. his story correctly, it's so crazy, it's hard for me to, to uh, like, if I'm not making a little bit of it up, but if I remember correctly, he told me that he and, and his friends were playing, and the police just came and grabbed one of the boys, teenager, maybe early teen, something like that, threw him in the back of the trunk, and took off with them, right? And later on, he was found dead. And it's just, like, wow. it's crazy, right? But, yeah. So, I mean, it was bad back then. But I don't think it's, generally speaking, I don't think it's like that today, you know? There is, I feel like there is a prejudice amongst police, but it is for, in my opinion, it's in many ways for good reason, you know? Well, for for two reasons. One, the police really do, black people, commit Mm -hmm. more violence, you know. And it's not because we're black, but it's because, in my opinion, it's because a lot of us are missing fathers. And when you miss your father, then your behavior in in any society starts to get a little crazy, you know. You know, you have the suburban, and I think this might be a good example, you have a lot of blacks that live in the suburbs, who do have their fathers, and a lot of them do really well in society. And then you have a lot of, fortunately, you have a lot of blacks in the city. A lot of them don't have their fathers, and they get into a lot of trouble and stuff like that. And that's not, again, it's not because they're black. It's because father is not in the picture, you know. And so I'm thinking when you're a cop and you pull a guy over, if you think that he is... Uh, more likely to be a problem, you're going to be a little bit more trigger happy, you know? So I think that you have the police being a little, and this is even with black officers, you know, when they go to pull over a fellow black guy, if he fits a certain look, then for self-preservation purposes, you're going to immediately start to profile. Now, once you start to talk to them, and this has been my experience, you know, I'll get pulled over, most of the time, I'm pretty decently dressed or whatnot, so, and I, and I talk very respectfully to officers. This is exactly what I've been taught, though, you know. Whenever you get pulled over, it doesn't matter whether the officer is white, black, whatever, who cares? You speak respectfully because they're coming from authority. That's not difficult for me either because I had a dad who was a very strong authority figure in our, <laughs> in our house. So, but anyway, really, you just need to teach your kids any color, but especially if they're black, you need to teach them to respect authority, you know, and that'll avoid a lot of trouble. Just being respectful is my opinion. So especially today, maybe back in the olden days, be a whole nother story, but today be respectful, be polite, and, you know, it'll work itself out. The situation will work itself out. So. I don't know. For me, our oldest, Denise, who's almost four, she, she obviously knows mom is white, daddy's black, because she associates, like, uh, well, for example, we showed her a picture of uh, two seahorses, one was white and one was black, she's like, oh, mommy's seahorse and daddy's seahorse, you know, so, like, in her mind, she clearly knows we're different, and so I think, I think it'll just come up as the years go by, different colors of people, and and I think we'll just dress it as it goes, not that we're going to make a point, you know, when she's, I don't know how old, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure people will say something to her, you know, very early on, and it'll it'll come up. 
Yeah, yeah, I like what you said, Sam, because I, of course, I was born and raised in the Caribbean, so we don't have this give the talk to the police, you know. The island I grew up on was 99.9% black, so all the, the entire police force is black, everybody's black, so you, you don't really have this tension. So, talking about giving the talk, you know, I don't know what kind of talk I need to give besides what you said, you know. I'm going to teach my boys to obey authority. You know, that's what I'm teaching them now. Even now, they love police. They love sirens. They love all these things. And, you know, my oldest, he's five. I would say to him, when someone in authority tell you to do something, what do you do? You obey. You know, I think we can fight our battles in the court of law. Is the justice system always fair? No, but there's the one we have. And trust me, it's better than the one in our career, so, you know, so, <laughs> you know, it's the one we have, and we can't always trust it, but I think that, for most part, the justice system we have try its best to come to the truth, and I don't think it always does, and I don't think it can always come to the truth. I just feel like they always try to come to the truth, and trying to fight your battle and be the judge, jury, and prosecutor of your case on the side of the road is probably not the best route to go. So let me piggyback on what you're yeah. saying in CG. Yeah. We talk about how the justice system in this country is not perfect, but we try to get to truth. I mean, we strive for that. And that reminds me, particularly talking about interracial marriage. And Sam, you talked about how for your grandpa, it was, it was pretty bad back in those days. Like it was dangerous to literally just be black because a cop could just show up and put you in a trunk and you could disappear and be found dead days later. And so it was a very serious thing, not just to be black, but also this issue of interracial dating. Look at the next question here. In 1967, this is Loving versus Virginia, where an interracial couple, and again, we say that colloquially, the interracial couple is thrown in jail for a year because they married each other. And today we hear that and we think, like, what? But back in the, the day, that was a reality. What are your thoughts on Loving versus Virginia? Yeah, so Loving versus Virginia, that's about the law that was passed. I don't remember the name mm -hmm. in Virginia that prohibits interracial marriage. I think it's something about I forget the name of the law, but it has something to do with like preserving racial integrity or something that's like what they call the law. Yeah, forbids interracial marriage. I think that law, obviously, I'm I'm biased, but I think that law is terrible law, you know. But I'm going to say something a little controversial, and that is that I don't feel that the Supreme Court came to the right conclusion. They were, I feel like they're trying to come to the right conclusion, and but I don't think they entirely arrived in their ruling. So the Supreme Court, if I remember correctly, I went went over the case a little earlier. Ultimately, I want to say that they decided unanimously that Virginia's prohibiting of uh, interracial marriage was unconstitutional. And they cited the 14th Amendment and the Equal mm -hmm. Protection Clause, where the law should apply equally to everyone, right? And I don't see, personally, how that clause applies to the Virginia law and how that clause would make the Virginia law unconstitutional. Don't get me wrong. I think the law is horrible. It shouldn't exist. But from, from that standpoint, I don't see how that constitutional clause prohibits that law. You know, I think there are other ways that you could have attacked the law constitutionally, honestly. So one of the things I noticed in that law is that if you were married, before the law was passed, then this law says that, at least if you're living in Virginia, your marriage is annulled or voided, and that if you continue living together, then you're now living in sin, and you can be punished for that, right? That's one of the things that that law says. And the Constitution very clearly says in Article 1, Section 9, Clause 3, that no bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. And it's commonly accepted that these laws are not to be passed in the federal or state governments, right? So what does that mean, ex post facto law? So that's 
a law that's passed that criminalizes behavior that was legal before the law was passed, right? So if you had an interracial couple that got married before the law was passed, after the law is passed, they're now criminals for being married, or if they continue being married, they're criminals. And I, I think you could argue that violates the anti ex post facto clause, if you will, in the U.S. Constitution. In addition to that, the Constitution says, and, and I, I need to go back and find out where, but I'm pretty sure that the Constitution says that licenses are to be given full faith and credit across the Union. So if you get a license in one state, it needs to apply in another state. And that's another area where you can attack this law that Virginia passed. And that is, they say that if you go and get married in another state and then you come back to Virginia, that's a criminal act under that statute in Virginia as well. And that's, from my interpretation of the Constitution, that's totally unconstitutional. So unfortunately, that's not looking at it from a racial standpoint. But honestly, I don't see how you can based off of the language in our Constitution, you know. I think that if we wanted to really secure interracial marriage from a constitutional standpoint, we'd probably have to pass a constitutional amendment, honestly, because the Constitution doesn't clearly state anything about race, you know. And some people say, well, what about the fact that this law is being applied unfairly to blacks? Well, you could argue that and say that, well, the Constitution requires that law be applied equally to everyone. But then those who are against interracial marriage say, well, yeah, but when we lock up the black half of the couple, we also lock up the white half of the couple. And it doesn't have to be white or black. It could be Asian and white or Asian and black or Asian and Hispanic. And I think that's a, a valid legal argument. It's not a moral argument, but from a legal standpoint, I think that's I think that's valid. Now, I don't think everyone's going to agree with me on that, but if you use this equal protection clause, then that really opens up a lot of other strange, crazy rulings that could come, you know? You could say, in, in my opinion, you know, you could start to argue why couldn't two other citizens, maybe an adult, I know this sounds nuts, but I'm starting to, with such a liberal interpretation, why couldn't an adult and a child? marry. Well, we have laws that prohibit that, but how can they prohibit that, you know? Because now they're, whatever they mean by equal, equal, equal application of the law, they can say, well, you they can say, you know, the child loves this adult, and the adult loves the child, and they should be treated the same as everybody else. You know, it, it gets a little crazy. I don't think that the Constitution can really be used to, I don't think that that equal protection clause applies to those kind of situations you might be able to find another clause in the Constitution. Or honestly, you know, our government and our laws aren't perfect, so it might just be a case where you have to amend the laws or the Constitution, you know? Yeah, I see what you're saying. I think Virginia actually was arguing some of the points you just made. Um, I can't say I fully agree, but I, I see where you're coming from because later down, they actually used the loving case to actually rule in favor of gay marriage. So how do you guys feel now that they actually taken quite honestly something that is sacred in terms of your color of your skin or your your racial background and then putting it towards something that the Bible clearly states that is sin? How do you guys feel about that? Because I think you kinda alluded to that a little bit, Sam, but if you want to expound a little bit more. Yeah. Real quick, I just want to make sure the audience understood. I do think that you can make a very strong case that the laws that prohibit interracial marriage are at a state level, that they're unconstitutional. I just don't think it's the 14th Amendment that you can use to make that argument. So I think in the case of Virginia, I think, like I mentioned earlier, it's other clauses. So anyway, going on to your current question, the whole idea of gay marriage and, and how that's been opened up. You know, honestly, if Loving versus Virginia and the 14th Amendment applies to Loving versus Virginia as the Supreme Court says it does, then honestly, I think that if that precedent is true, then I think that the Supreme Court has no choice but to legalize gay marriage as well, unfortunately, because Again, if we're going to use the Equal Protection Clause in such a liberal way, 
then why can we say that two people that, and, and again, this is not a moral, I'm not looking at this from a moral standpoint, I'm looking at this just legally. If we're going to say that states can't outlaw a white and a black person from marrying because they have equal protection under the law, and then why can't we say that about any other couple? That as long as they're citizens, you know, then the equal protection clause would apply to them, you know? So I think that opens up a huge can of worms. Now, if somebody were to ask me from an ethics standpoint, how can you say that interracial marriage is okay and gay marriage isn't, which is, is what I believe, right? Interracial marriage is fine, gay marriage is not. So if anybody's going to ask that question, how can you morally come to that conclusion? I think you have to look at a few things, you know. You can first look at the original pattern of marriage, um, where you have Adam and Eve. And I know this is uh, something that people say commonly, right? Adam was a man, he was a woman, and God said that the woman was to be a helpmate to the man. And then you look at every other example of marriage in the Bible. It's man and wife, right? Um, never in the Bible is there a, uh, a gay couple that is uh, um, accepted as okay. You know, in fact, you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, and you have a lot of things like that going on. And God wiped out the entire city because of their sodomy, right? I want to say Deuteronomy chapter twenty, and it's elsewhere as well in the Bible. It's in the New Testament as well, and maybe Hebrews, where the Bible makes it clear that man is not to lie with man as he would with a woman, right? So that means that homosexual activity is forbidden from a biblical standpoint. Uh, so if the Bible forbids homosexual behavior, then surely homosexual marriage is also forbidden, you know? And so from a, from a moral standpoint, you can, you can say that the Bible is, is very much against homosexual marriage. And, and some people make the argument, well, God made me this way, you know, which is such a horrible thing to say. Or some people may say that they were born that way. And, you know, to me, that's a funny argument because I feel like we are all born in sin and we all have propensities towards doing bad things, you know. Some people have a temper and some people are, you know, speaking frankly, there is a strong temptation probably for every one of us to, at one point in time or another, to fornicate, commit adultery, stuff like that. And that urge can be very strong. Can we not say, oh, well, I was born like that, you know? Well, yeah, we were born with these flaws, but we have to keep ourselves under control, you know, with the help of Christ. If we do not, we'll commit all sorts of sins, you know. So, that's my feeling on the matter. I do think they did corner themselves by the wording. Yeah, but I think they cornered themselves so they, they have to allow for the game yet. It's the first precedent, yeah, that they came up with, if that's true, yeah. I almost want to ask who to blame for this, you know, because unfortunately, if it was just the world, and this was a part of the world, and it was just Virginia and the other states that blocked this, and there were no Christian influence or no Christian beliefs that kind of pushed this, I would say, you know what, I can you expect the world to be the world. But unfortunately, we also see even this ban at times within the church and within institutions that should know the truth. And just to shift gears a little bit, because I want to touch a little bit on Bob Jones University, where they actually prevented interracial dating for years. And the federal government had to basically hit them over their heads. And what are you feeling in that? Because then the federal government was doing something bad in terms of Virginia, or the states were doing something bad in terms of Virginia. And it was in multiple other states as well, and it wasn't just Virginia. And then you have the Christian institutions now following the same thing. What do you guys thought on Bob Jones University, especially having this rule for years? I think initially they had a rule where they weren't even accepting 
black students then they changed and they had a rule where they were only accepting black girls and then they had a rule that you can't date interracially whether it's black and white or black and asian or asian and white or whatever the case may be for me i think first of all i think that's a again a shame to the church that we would behave like that you know and bob jones is associated with the church so it's a shame to us so obviously i don't agree with those restrictions from bob jones that i believe like you said have been done away with now but they were they were quite real i want to say when we were or when i was preparing to go to school in fact that's one of the reasons why i didn't go to bob jones mm. but because of their more prejudiced environment is how i felt about it but that being said i am not so I don't look so favorably on the government getting involved and stuff like that. I do like to have more liberty, if you will. And I feel like when the federal government can get involved, first of all, it's, it's a church organization. And if the government can say that we don't think you should not allow, we don't think that you should have these restrictions, even if it, they're using religious reasons, in this case, ill-informed reasons the bible doesn't say what what the bob jones people were feeling but it's not up to the government to interpret the bible right i feel like that's up to the church and for the for the government to get involved in that i don't like that so much and i don't even think that it was that uh necessary because there were plenty of alternatives right so uh, I know in the past, like during the civil rights movement, the government got involved, and in many occasions that may have been more necessary because there was nowhere or very few places that black people could go for relief or for proper treatment, and it covered just about every aspect of life, you know. But in the 2000s, there were plenty of schools, PCC for one, you know, that you could go to and you wouldn't be, those policies weren't there, you know? So, yeah, I like the whole idea of if somebody's not treating you right or if somebody doesn't have the right attitude, go somewhere else, you know? You don't have to, I don't feel like I have to cram my, what I want down somebody else's throat. As long as they're not coming after me, then, you know, we can exist together. I guess the other thing is, like, I see the government really mandating certain, like, diversities and stuff like that. And while that's all, on many occasions, it's meant to be a good thing, for me, sometimes it's a bad thing because, you know, sometimes this has happened where I'll get hired because I helped them meet some quota, but then it turns out that they really didn't want me, right? And then, ultimately, I don't keep the job. Because while they're trying to please the government, they're not really friendly towards, in this case, black folks, you know. So I got another job. I enjoy it so much better, much better environment, too. But, you know, for me, I like, if somebody's prejudiced, I like to know, as opposed to the, gov the government. Again, sometimes they have to get involved, but in society today where there's a lot more freedom, I'd rather the government not be so heavy handed because then if somebody is prejudiced, I want them to, I, I, I kind of like them being a little bit obvious about it because then I know who to avoid. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So. Yeah. You know, what was interesting, you said that you blamed the church a little bit for Bob Jones. And I think you're right. It should have been the church who hit Bob Jones over the head rather than the federal government. But to our shame, the church didn't hit Bob Jones over the head about it, so the federal government had to step in. And I'm not saying the federal government had the right to step in a private institution, but the students that were going to Bob Jones were from churches that, for most part, preaches and practices the truth. And they weren't hitting Bob Jones over the head about this until the federal government stepped in. And I think once the federal government stepped in, there was like an organization of former students that kind of put pressure on them to say, hey, you, you really need to change this rule. But what stood out to me, Bob Jones III was on Larry King Live back in 2001 or 2000. And he said 
to Larry King when Larry King asked him that there's actually no biblical foundation for this rule. He can't explain why they have the rule, wow. but then he said there's no biblical foundation for the rule. And I'm like, if there's no biblical foundation for the rule, why do you have the rule again? <laughs> That's a good question. I hadn't heard that. That's what kind of going through my mind and this. And then I'm going to read something from Paul Chappell. And again, I'm not hitting these men because Paul Chappell, I have his devotional books. I have books that I read from him. I read his articles. I think he's a man who loved the Lord. But I have a, a memo that he sent out to students. Cause, you know, he has a college as well. And the title of the article that I found was Paul Chappell warns about interracial marriage in 2001 college memo. And he used Second Corinthians 6, verse 14, talk about interracial marriage. But he said here, the exotic relationship. When two people from radically different cultural or ethnic backgrounds get together, the result is an exotic relationship. Some people fall in love with the idea of being in love with someone totally different from themselves. Exotic relationships are exciting and adventurous, but extremely impractical. The challenges of dating and marriage are challenging enough without throwing the wild card of mixing different cultural and ethnic backgrounds. Then he said, get lots of counsel from parents, pastors, mentors, and friends on this one. And this was in 2001. Just as Bob Jones were getting away from that rule, you got a memo like this from, again, a prominent figure putting something out i have my feelings on this i want to give you guys kind of digest and tell me what you're feeling on that well i'm i'm a little surprised actually when he, <laughs> when he said that out yeah you know when i hear you read that memo i hear two things so it could be that he is trying to discourage interracial marriage because he is completely against it right or the other thing that I hear, and I wouldn't honestly be surprised if it's a combination of the two. So maybe not completely against it, but somewhat against it. The other thing that I hear is, you know, first of all, he didn't just say people from two different ethnic backgrounds, but he also mentioned cultural and so forth and so on. So if I were to take him literally at what he's saying, then my most charitable interpretation would be that he is warning about you know, if you have, let's just say, somebody from France and you have somebody from Siberia, they're both white, right? Uh, but the cultures are extremely different, you know? So the French may be a little bit more refined and they may have certain expectations that you behave in a certain refined way, especially if you're from Paris or something like that. Uh, but if you're from Siberia, it's a really harsh place, really harsh environment there. You know, they may expect a certain toughness. So maybe you have the man from Siberia, the woman's from France, and the man is very tough, you know, and he meets her family, and they're like, oh my goodness, this guy is a barbarian. He's really tough, and he cracks everybody's hands when he shakes them, and, you know, just a really rough guy. We don't think, or whatever, you know, the parents may have a fit, and there might be all sorts of culture clashes and stuff like that. And so, you know, that might be a scenario that is covered in Paul Chappell's memo and other things, other situations like that. You even have, you know, Hispanic or, or black cultures are very different depending on where you're from. You know, it's like you have blacks from Africa and blacks from America and the cultures are very, in many cases, they're very different. Right? You know, and blacks from Africa mm -hmm. oftentimes are sure all blacks yep. from America. I hate to say it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, cultural difference, I think that is something to be mindful of when you are going to date and hopefully, you know, marry somebody. Uh, cultural difference can be a, a big stumbling block. And so I think that Paul Chappell's memo is correct in that you should be very thoughtful and you should be very careful if you're marrying people that are of a very different culture than your own. So I think that's good advice. Now, what did Paul Chappell intend by his memo? I don't know. I have been in a situation before where people have said things like what Paul Chappell has said. And while they're making valid arguments, I didn't feel like 
their heart was a heart of providing good advice. I felt like their heart was that of trying to, you know, poo-poo interracial marriage. And if that's what they're trying to do, I don't like that, right? But if they're trying to give good advice, you know, I think that really is good advice, and, and you have to be mindful. If your cultural differences are, are huge, marriage is tough, you know, and that can be one more thing to add to your difficulty, so... Well, when Sam and I, when we first started dating, the whole cultural thing and um, our family, like, can this work? But after meeting Sam's family, to, you know, his parents, it was like, oh, my goodness. Yes, of course it can work because our families are very similar, and that's why I think that's why we work. You know, our values are the same, all that. But it's like, but yeah, if, oh, my goodness, if we had grown up, so different than each other, like I don't think you can do this thing. I don't. <laughs> you know? And you know, we could make it with the Lord's help. <laughs> but I think it would be very difficult. I do. This is the Removing Barriers Podcast. We will be right back. Sometimes, no matter how great the selection, you just can't find exactly what you want. Design It Yourself custom gift baskets solve that problem by allowing you to choose the specific products you want to include with your unique gift basket. And in addition to hand selecting the products, you can further personalize your custom basket by adding coffee mugs, stuffed animals, mylar balloons, or even an imprinted ribbon. When you're done, We'll put it all together in a -a one-of-a-kind, perfect basket and ship or hand-deliver it directly to your lucky recipient. Click in the description section to design your basket today. You know, we talked about these respected men who we know love the Lord, have a heart for people, have a heart for His church, and even they can blunder make a mistake here or there and we have to have grace with each other right but talking about the church overall it doesn't seem like historically the church has been ahead of the culture on this thing even though we have the scriptures and we have the holy spirit why do you think that is no i just think a lot of it might be burned out of fear because of what people live through not that a lot of people want to ignore what the bible says but just based off of, you know, talking with even just Sam's grandparents, you know, and how they think it's just so wonderful to see, you know, that, wow, the more these troubles are happening, you know, that's just my thought. It's maybe just a fear thing to open up that topic. Yeah, I think that that may be a fear thing. I was at a preacher's convention earlier this year, right in the middle of COVID, actually. That was kind of nice because I hadn't been, you know, physically church for a little bit of all the churches were shut down. So, but they had a preacher's conference and I got to sit in on that. And uh, one of the preachers, black preacher from somewhere in Alabama, I don't want to identify him. But one of the black preachers, he was talking about, he leads a black congregation and more white people start to move into the neighborhood and they start going to the church. Anyway, he started getting flack from some of the old members for allowing the other color in, you know, and, and they're kind of like, well, maybe they should go to their own church or whatever, stuff like that. And he didn't go along with that. Right. It was like, everybody's welcome. So today it's a church that's white, black, and Asian mostly. And I think they have a few Hispanic people. Everyone's welcome, but the demographics that happen to show up are predominantly white, black, and, and Asian. So, but yeah, he made a stand there where everybody's welcome, you know. If you want to worship Christ, then you're welcome, you know. And or if you need to if you want to know more about Christ, if you need to get saved, whatever, anybody who needs to be ministered is, is welcome at the church. And that caused a little bit of a problem with these people and there were a bunch of folks that walked out and that was fine. It was a small church. It hit the church in, in the pocketbook because now a big chunk of their support was gone. But his point was, you know, my job is, is not to please man. Uh, it's to please the Lord, you know. And it's the Lord who ordained him to be a preacher, and he needs to do what God called him to do. So that is to share 
the, the gospel and to minister to, to everyone, you know. So that's the stance we took. And it's worked out, honestly. But, you know, I think, like Alyssa said, it's fear. That's one of the reasons why the many churches aren't ahead in this issue. And I think the other thing is just looking at Christians as a whole, so not just the church and church leadership, but all of us. I think another big problem is we don't read the Bible, you know, so we don't really know what is acceptable and what's not because we don't look at God's word. So Christianity, I feel, has been for many, it's just like a uh, uh, an exercise that's been passed down from generation to generation, and it's not personal, and and we don't have a relationship, a strong one with God. How should interracial marriage be addressed in our current culture? How should it be addressed in our church? How would you want anyone that see you in public address it? How interracial marriage should be addressed? In the church, I think the answer is pretty obvious, and that is we should address interracial marriage from a scriptural standpoint, you know. So if there are folks in the church that feel like interracial marriage shouldn't be allowed, we can, you know, pretty much go over what we discussed a little bit ago, examples in the Bible where interracial marriage is very clearly accepted, you know, and, and God even, like like we mentioned with Moses, and that was in Numbers, I think it's Numbers 12, 1 to 15, you know, the deal where the Israelis were complaining about Moses' black wife, you know, and God made it very clear that they need to not complain about that, you know. So you have that example, and then, of course, you have the example of Ruth and Boaz. She was a believer, very clearly, because Naomi and her family had converted Ruth. So there wasn't any religious, and probably not even so much of a cultural, you know, issue at that point, because she'd been with Naomi for so long. And and God was perfectly fine with Ruth being in the family. In fact, if you want to look at it this way, Jesus is the descendant of an interracial marriage, you know, because Ruth was of a different ethnicity, you know, than the Jews. But she ends up being the grandmother, I think, of David or great-grandmother of David. In the church, I think Scripture backs up the acceptance Oh, and God speaking out very clearly in favor of interracial marriage. So in favor meaning, you know, it's it's fine. It's perfectly okay. And in society, how do we address it? I don't know. I mean, I really think that the church should be at the forefront, you know, of this issue. Uh, unfortunately, many of us are not in the church. But if the church were at the lead of this issue, you know, in the early history of our country, then it probably wouldn't be that much of an issue today. And th thankfully, it's becoming less of an issue, but the church really could have helped in a major way. And honestly, if the church would have been on point with this issue earlier, you know, there may be many things that we see today, like gay marriage, that really wouldn't have been able to make so strong of a foothold in culture like it has. For me, growing up in Northern Michigan, there's not a lot of black people up there. I don't ever remember this being preached about in church. So basically, if the preachers and the teachers were to teach from the pulpit, expound on the gospel, and explain how the gospel brings us all to an equal standing at the foot of the cross, perhaps the outcome would have been different? Is that what you're referring to? So what is it about the gospel that unites us so in terms of making us realize that interracial marriage is not as big of a an issue as we're making it to be in our flesh? Like, like we talk about how people have made interracial relationships into sin when it's not. And that's because they're not preaching and teaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So why is the gospel the, I guess, the leveling tool, the, the the hammer that kind of makes us understand that this is not the sin that we think it is? When you're asking that question, 
what immediately popped into my mind, and I'm trying to figure a way to uh, expound upon this. What immediately popped into my mind was Darwinism, actually. And I think that might be another reason why you know, this is not maybe so much of an indictment on the church, but more on our society. Why is interracial marriage unaccepted in our society as a whole, or why is it that it wasn't in the past? Why is it that we have racism, you know? And I think that Darwinism doesn't help, because with Darwinism, you have the whole idea that humans evolved, the predominant theory being from apes or monkeys, you were less capable primates. And you're naturally going to think that it's, it's very strongly possible that some people have evolved more than others, you know? And some of us, unfortunately, may look a little bit more like monkeys than others, dare I say that? I mean, I'm black, right? So uh, a lot of people are like, oh, well, and this is so wrong, but I've heard people say, oh, he looks like a monkey, you know, black guy or whatnot. And, um, and you know, with Darwinism, that, like, if somebody says that, that's insulting, but with Darwinism, that takes on a whole other meaning because it's almost like they're saying that a black individual didn't evolve as much as a white person, right? Or another ethnic group may have evolved. And so anyway, I think that causes division amongst us. But this ties into the gospel in that the gospel, you know, that's the good news, how we can know that we're going to heaven, you know, how we can be saved. And before we can understand the gospel and how to be saved, how to get to heaven, we have to understand the problem or the predicament that all mankind is in, you know. We just look back at the beginning of the Bible. You have Adam and Eve, and they sin. And when they sin, all of their children become sinful as well, you know. And so now all of mankind is affected by the sin of, of Adam and Eve. We inherit it through them, you know. So. When we look at that, we realize that, you know, we're all in the same boat, right? Which goes, now goes against Darwinism because now, in a big way, at least, it goes against the, the thoughts of Darwinism, and that is that we're all separate or, or somewhat on different groups of people. No, we're all one race. We all have a sin nature. And then not only did Adam bring sin into the world, but then God has to sin another man, so he didn't send another goat or cow or chicken, he sent a man, right? Because only a man can save fellow man from sin. He sent a sinless man, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins and, and rise again on the third day, because Jesus was sinless, so he couldn't death, you know, the penalty for sin, and that penalty couldn't keep Jesus down, because he never sinned, but he paid the price for us. You know, and that applies to everyone. Every person, if they accept Christ, can be saved from sin and eternal damnation because Christ shed his blood for us, you know. And so if Jesus' blood applies to all of us, then that means that we're all, you know, of the same race, the human race. There are two scriptures that pop into my mind. One is very common, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, whosoever, right, believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So that's whosoever. So any person that accepts Christ's gift of salvation can be saved. So that, to me, sounds like God's not being very, he's not looking at us from our man-made racial, if you will, divisions. He's looking at us all as one group of people that need to be saved, you know. And then also I look at Second Peter. Uh not Second Peter. Yeah, Second Peter chapter three, verse nine, you know, towards the uh, second half of the verse he says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, you know. And again that's a reference I think that does refer to salvation as well, you know. And so he doesn't want anybody to perish if any person accepts Christ's gift of salvation, they are saved, you know, and so 
we're all in God's eyes, we're all we're all one. Again, I think that man puts too much look on the outward appearance, you know, but God doesn't look at us like we look at each other. You know, we're all mankind as far as God's concerned. So all one blood. So just different families. Amen. Sam and Alyssa, thank you for joining us on the Removing Barriers podcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you for listening. To get a hold of us or to support this podcast, go to anchor.fm forward slash removing barriers. This has been the Removing Barriers podcast. We attempted to remove barriers so that we all can have a clear view of the cross.